Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. It's a great pleasure to be here with you again on this beautiful Lord's Day. We are going to be going through, uh, I couldn't help but when I, we were singing that, I couldn't help but thinking of Dr. Vernon McGee, may I say to you, All right? Um, we're going to be looking at a number of apologetic issues in the next couple of Sundays. Today we're going to look at Islam. Next week we're going to look at Roman Catholicism. We're also going to look at postmodernism. Does truth matter anymore? And we're also going to be looking at cultural Marxism, which has invaded our churches, invaded our schools, our governments, and so forth. So these courses are absolutely important. Um, these pews should be packed with people, with Christians who are zealous for the defense of their faith. If this was a Super Bowl, we would have to add additions to this church to accommodate everybody. And so today we're going to be talking about Islam. How many of you have Muslim friends? How many of you work with Muslim uh, co co-workers? Uh, anybody have uh, Muslim neighbors? How many of them have you witnessed the gospel to? Yeah, fewer hands. Why? Why are we not sharing the gospel with our Muslim friends? God says in Ezekiel 3.18 that when I say to the wicked, you shall die, and you do not warn them, and they die, God's going to hold their blood at your hands. You're accountable. We have the antidote, and we need to reach out to our Muslim friends. Mississauga is the most con concentrated place in Canada with the most Muslims. Muslims are rapidly growing in Canada. They are growing uh, globally by birth rates. They are imposing uh, threatening conditions in France today in the United Kingdom as well, where they are now imposing Sharia law, that is the Islamic law, and they're trying to do that in Canada as well, and they have the greatest aid to facilitate that. His name is Justin Trudeau. And so, folks, we need to know how to share the gospel with our Muslim friends, and I want to give you an introduction to Islam. This is not, you're not going to become experts in this in one Sunday in an hour's time, but I want us to become familiar with Islam, and I want you to understand that Islam is not a religion that worships the one true God. It is not a partner with Christianity or with Judaism. And so what we want to do today then is just want to make sure that we're coordinating here. We are. Let's define the word Islam. What does Islam mean? If you hear in the media, you'll hear people say, Islam means peace. No, it doesn't. The word for peace is salam, like the Hebrew shalom. Islam means submission. It means surrender. It means forced submission. It's also used in military context to force people to submit to an invading army. Islam is submission. Submission to who? Submission to Allah, the God of Islam. And the word Muslim is related to that word Islam, and Muslim means one who submits. Muslims believe that all the prophets were Muslims. Noah was a Muslim. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob were Muslims. Ishmael was a Muslim. David, Solomon were Muslims, Jonah was a Muslim, John the Baptist was a Muslim, Jesus was a Muslim, and the final prophet that was sent to the world was Muhammad. So in the Islamic mind, all the prophets are Muslims. In fact, Adam was a Muslim. All creatures are Muslims. They're all called to submit to Allah, including the universe. And so in Islam, they believe that all human beings are born Muslims but they abandon their faith. They follow false religions like Christianity and Judaism and other polytheistic religions. The Quran says in chapter 7 that when Allah created Adam, he brought forth his progeny, all of his descendants before him, and he entered into a covenant with them and said, do you acknowledge me as your Lord? And we all said, we do. And Allah said, remember this, for this shall be used against you on the day of judgment. So all of you are closet Muslims. You just don't know it. And when you become a Muslim, they don't say you converted, they say you have reverted. It's reversion. You become what you were originally meant to be. You need to understand this, that our Muslim friends have a worldview like we do, and their worldview is that you are all renegades. You have abandoned the true religion of God by deifying a Jew by the name of Jesus Christ and by teaching polytheism in the doctrine of the Trinity. That's what they believe. Now, one in every five people in the world, this is now going to one in every four, almost 25% of the world's population is Muslim. Most people think that Muslims are Arabs. Well, they are, but they're not all, Mus they're not all Arabs. The majority of Muslims who live in this world are non-Muslims. 85% of them are not Arabic. 15% are in the Middle East. The country that has more Muslims per capita is not Saudi Arabia, it's not Pakistan, it is Indonesia. Indonesia has more Muslims per capita than any other country. 
And so don't think of Muslim as Arab, wearing a turban. Muslims come in every shape and color. There's white Muslims, black Muslims, brown Muslims, yellow Muslims. Muslims come from every part of the world. Muslims hold to two sources of authority. The first one is the Quran. The Quran is composed of 114 chapters called surahs. It's about the size of our New Testament. And it's written in Arabic, considered the heavenly language. That's why Muslims pray in Arabic, all of them. 85% of them don't even know what they're saying. And so when they do their prayers, they'll say, Bismillah, Ar-Rahmin, Allahu Akbar. They have no idea. Most of them don't even know what they're saying. They're just taught to say it because they have to speak in that sacred language. If you check my YouTube channel, I have a lot of short videos where I say, well, if Allah is the creator of the universe, then wouldn't he know all the languages of the world? Wouldn't he know English and Spanish and Portuguese and Italian? Of course he would. Why is it that you have to only pray in Arabic? Well, because Islam is a colonizing religion. It's about Arabization. Everywhere Islam goes, it Arabizes everything. So you go to Africa, North Africa, which is majority Muslim, you have Africans with Muslim names, like Abdullah. They're dressed like Arabs. They have Arab architecture. And that's because Islam believes that the Arab culture from which Muhammad emerged is the superior culture. The Quran even says Muslims are the best of all peoples. And the worst of all peoples are the Jews and the Christians. You will never hear that on CNN. And you'll never hear that in the mainstream media. So the Quran is considered to be the eternal word of Allah. So Allah is the Arabic name for the deity, meaning the God. And the Quran, if you've ever read it, is chronologically disorganized. It's organized by the longest chapter to the shortest chapter. I would advise you to get yourselves a copy of the Quran. If you're too cheap to get a hard copy, there's many online uh, URLs that you can go to to read the Quran online. But you need to read it. You need to know what your Muslim friends believe. The second source of authority is called the Hadith. And the Hadith is like an encyclopedia collection that records the sayings and deeds of Muhammad. And the Hadith informs Muslims how they should live. Why do Muslim men grow their beards long and shave their mustaches? Because Muhammad told them to distinguish themselves from the Jews and the Christians who grow their beards with their mustaches. Muslims are to shave their mustaches, have long beards to distinguish them from the unbelievers. Why do Muslim women cover up? Because Muhammad's wives were told to cover up. Why do Muslims not own dogs? Because dogs are haram, they're unclean. Because Muhammad said, kill all the dogs. Maybe we should call PETA about this one. Muhammad is the role model that Muslims are to follow. Mus Muhammad killed those who criticized his faith. Muslims killed those who criticized Islam. Muhammad killed those who opposed him. Muslims opposed those who opposed the Sharia law. Muhammad was an anti-Semite, a raving anti-Semite. He hated the Jews because the Jews rejected him and called him a false prophet. And eventually he was poisoned, which eventually killed him by a Jewish woman after he had murdered her father, her brother, her husband, and then he raped her. And then he asked her to make him dinner. That's a very classy move. Asking someone who you just killed her family, you raped her, and then you said, can you make me some dinner? She made him some lamb, lamb uh, for dinner and she poisoned the lamb and eventually it killed him. So much for being a prophet of God. You think God would at least have warned him. And so the reason why Muslim men enter, whenever Muslims enter the, 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 the mosque, they always enter with the right foot first. Why? Because when you go to the bathroom, you enter with your left foot. Well, why is that? Because Muhammad did it. Everything is patterned after Muhammad. So in Islam, you can marry women or girls younger than nine years old. You can marry nine-year-old girls, and you can also marry girls that are younger than nine years old because the Quran says you can marry girls that are not, have not menstruated yet. There's no age limit. So in the Muslim world today, Amnesty International has recorded, many little girls die on the wedding night because they're too young. But of course, do you hear that in mainstream media? Not at all. You put some bacon on, a, on the handlebars of a, a mosque, you'll hear it 24-7. Trudeau will get out on Twitter and condemn all this anti-Semitic, all this Islamophobia that, that Christians in Canada is involved in. And by the way, Islamophobia is a term that the Muslims invented because they noticed the, 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 the LGBTQ was using homophobia. Hey, why don't we use our own phobia? Let's talk about Islamophobia. What does that mean? You criticize Islam, you criticize the Quran, you're an Islamophobe. You criticize Christianity in the Bible, you're progressive. You're a liberating person. So I've created my own term, Christophobia. And so when people criticize the, the Bible, I said, you're a Christophobe. 
and they become all you know, very woke and sensitive there and triggered. I'm just playing their game. There's also the Sira of Muhammad. There's a, there's a biography of Muhammad called Sira al-Rasul, the life of the prophet, the biography of the prophet. And this was written 150 years after Muhammad. That's a long time. The Gospels were written a couple of decades after Jesus. Muhammad's biography, the first one, appears 150 years after his death. That one has disappeared. It's been edited by another editor who had to remove parts that were embarrassing about Muhammad. Isn't that interesting? A Muslim biographer admits there's embarrassing aspects of Muhammad's life. Are there any embarrassing aspects of the life of Jesus? Not at all. Did Jesus own slaves? No, but Muhammad owned a lot of black slaves. He traded them and he bought them. The, uh, the African, East African slave trade was begun by the Muslims. 40 million blacks were taken. The men were castrated and the women were taken as concubines. You ever hear that in high school? You ever hear about the transatlantic slave trade with the Americans and the Europeans? All the time. No one wants to talk about the Islamic slave trade. Why? Because that's Islamophobic. Wake up, church. They're coming after you. And so the Quran says... Uh, the Hadith and the Sirah, you get those three together and you form what's called the Sunnah. The Sunnah is the model of the Prophet. That is to say, if you want to learn how to live a good life, you have to imitate the Prophet. The Quran says, chapter 33, 21, you have indeed in the Messenger of Allah, title for Muhammad, a beautiful pattern of conduct for anyone whose hope is in Allah and in the final day and who engages much in the praise of Allah. So you want to be a good person, you don't imitate Jesus, you imitate Muhammad. And you imitate him to the T. So the reason why Muslims do what they do, they do in imitation of Muhammad. And then the Quran 68 verse 4, and verily you, O Muhammad, this is supposedly God speaking, are on an exalted standard of character. So to understand Islam, you need to understand this guy by the name of Muhammad. He's born in Saudi Arabia. He's the founder, prophet of Islam. His dates are 570 AD to 632 AD. And so born in Arabia, a very polytheistic country and religion, and in 610 AD, he resorts to a cave, and he tells us there that a spirit being appeared to him and commissioned him to be the prophet. Now, this spirit being is not identified at first. He just appears while Muhammad's in the cave, contemplating, you know, why, why what's life all about and so forth. And the spirit being grabs him by the throat and chokes him and says, Ekara, in Arabic, that means recite. Recite in the name of your Lord. And he goes, what am I supposed to recite? And then he squeezes him a second time. Recite in the name of your Lord. What am I supposed to recite? The third time he chokes him, he almost passes out. And then later he tells us this was the angel Gabriel, Jibril, who appeared to him. That sounds more like the Godfather, a scene out of the Godfather. I mean, in the Bible, did Gabriel go to Mary and say, you're going to be the mother of the Messiah? <laughs> like, this is mafia type stuff. And Muhammad thought it was a demon. He was right. And then he became suicidal. He wanted to cast himself off the, the mountain, the cliffs, because he thought he was possessed. And then later he was told, no, 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 this, was, this is the angel Gabriel who, who spoke to the prophets and so forth. But no, uh, angels don't appear and grab you by the throat and punch you around like it's the ultimate fighting championship. Angels come to you, and the first thing they say is, do not be afraid, fear not. So whatever Muhammad met in that cave was not from God. No prophet, after meeting with God, doubts that God spoke to them. Moses didn't walk away from the burning bush thinking, was that Beelzebub who spoke to me? Who was that? We don't find that. So in 610 AD, he receives the call. He starts preaching this newfound religion called Islam, submission to Allah. And he tells his Arab neighbors, you know, abandon all your gods, because the Arabs were polytheists, abandon all your gods and worship the one God, Allah. Now, all the pagans recognized Allah as the creator God. He was already a pagan God. He was recognized by the pagans. All Muhammad said was divorce all those other gods and just keep Allah. Well, they said, look, Muhammad, you know, we, we, we've listened to Paul McCartney and he said, live and let live. So don't push your religion on us. You keep your religion, we'll keep ours. Well, Muhammad just, said, just kept going at it, kept pushing it and pushing it to the point where the, 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 his neighbors said, we've got to get rid of this guy. He's ruining our economy. He's ruining our lives. And so they, they conspire to kill him. And then in 622 AD, he flees to Medina. From Mecca, he flees to Medina. And this is called the Hijrah, the migration, the flight. And 
In 622 AD, he leaves Mecca, goes to Medina, and there he goes into a very populous Jewish community, and there he receives new revelations that call for jihad, to fight against the unbelievers, to fight against the Jews and the Christians. And so he becomes a military commander. And then he comes and he fights the Arabs in Mecca and he invades Mecca and takes over their holy shrine called the Kaaba and so forth. So in the Muslim world, the calendar begins in 622. Ours begins before Christ and after Christ. The Jews counted from the creation of Adam, from the world, and Muslims counted from the migration. 622 is the beginning of the Islamic year. And later on, Muhammad is declared to be in the Quran the seal of the prophets, which means he is the last prophet. There is no prophet after Muhammad. He is the last of all the prophets. Muslims believe in five articles of faith. They must believe in these articles to be Muslims. They believe there's only one God, and that one God is not a trinity. Islam believes in a Unitarian God. That means there's only one person in the Godhead. Christians are Trinitarian monotheists. So when Muslims say, we believe in one God, and Christians say, we believe in one God, be careful. The fallacy of equivocation. You're both saying we believe in one God, but Muslims don't believe that God is Trinitarian. They reject the triune nature of God. They are Unitarian. There's only one person in God. That's not the same God, ladies and gentlemen. Please, please be wary. Words mean what they mean in context. What defines words is context. If I told you I went to the bank this morning, you're probably thinking, oh, he went to a financial institution to withdraw money. No, I went to the river bank. I went to, I, I went, I went to bank on something. What gives words their meaning is context. So all Muslims must believe there's one God. They are fiercely monotheistic, but Unitarian monotheism, not Trinitarian monotheism. Number two, all the prophets were sent by Allah to be witnesses to the world. They believe 124,000 prophets were sent to all the nations of the world with the same message. There's only one God, Allah, submit to him. That was the message of Jesus, of Moses, the message of Noah, and so forth. They believe in the angels, the heavenly messengers of Allah that he sends into the world to communicate his words because Allah cannot be seen. Angels are his intermediaries. They speak on behalf of Allah. So the revealing angel in the Quran is Gabriel, Jibril. They must believe in the books. Allah gave prophets books. He gave Moses the Torah, in Arabic, the Tarat. He gave David the Psalms, in Arabic, the Zabur. He gave Jesus the Gospel, the Injil. And then finally, the last revelation is the Quran. Does that sound familiar? When you get these young guys coming to your door, with white tops, they're 16 year old, and they're called elder. I've got t-shirts that are older than them. And they come to your door on their bicycles as they're riding through the neighborhood, and they come to your door and they say, we are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And the last revelation that God gave the world is the Book of Mormon, which is the book that completes the, the Bible. We'll take questions at the end, uh, sister. We'll take questions at the end. And yes, we do have a question period as well, folks. And then you've got others that come around with suitcases, right? Remember those guys? They come two and twos. On, they usually come on Sunday mornings to keep you from going to church. And their suitcases are portable ammunition dumps because they have magazines called the Watchtower and the Awake magazine. It's the same story. Christianity went apostate, and then there was this last prophet, this last messenger sent to the world. And they believe that about Muhammad as well. And the, his Quran. Now, when you talk to Muslims, they will say, we believe in the gospel, we believe in the Torah of Moses, but your Bibles are corrupt. You've got four gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Jesus only had one gospel. Moses had one Torah, you've got five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Your Bible's corrupted. That's why you need the Quran. How do I know that? Because for 30 years... I've been studying Islam, teaching about Islam, and I've debated Muslims. So if you go to my YouTube channel, Toronto Apologetics, you could see me debating Muslim imams. And one of the most famous is Shabir Ali. I've known him since 1991, and we debated over 12 times. I know their language, and they know that I know what they know. And that's why they don't like talking to me, because they know that I know what they know. They usually go to Christians that aren't 
deep in their faith, and they take advantage of them. You believe Jesus is God? Yes. Well, Jesus said to the rich young ruler, why do you call me good? There's no one good but God alone. How do you explain that? That's the response. Christians give, I don't don't know. i got to talk to my pastor. Really? Muslims know the Bible better than you do because they study it to convert you to Islam. Why is that? We should be zealous for our, our holy scriptures. They also believe in the last day. Allah will bring forth the last day where he will judge all humanity and he will cast all non-Muslims into hell. And in fact, Muslims who come to Allah, the, Quran, the hadith says, on that day Muslims will come to Allah with a mountain of sins on their back. Allah will take their sins and put it on a Jew and a Christian and throw them into hell and say, that's your rescue from hell. Your Muslim friends will never tell you this. It's in their sources. Your Muslim friends will tell you, we love Jesus. We love his mother Mary. They're mentioned in the Quran. We, we worship the same God. Because you don't realize that in Islam, there's a doctrine called taqiyah. Not taqila, taqiyah. And taqiyah means you can lie to the unbelievers to convert them to Islam. They have sanctioned lying in Islam to convert you. What did Jesus say? Who's the father of lies? Satan. First John, there no lie is of, no lie, he says, is of the truth. We are not called to lie, but to speak the truth. Islam also holds to the five pillars. Five articles, five pillars. You have to believe in the shahada. What is the shahada? The Arabic word shahada means to confess. To become a Muslim is very easy. To become a Christian, you have to give the Lord Jesus Christ, you have to believe in him and so forth, and then you confirm your salvation by baptism. Not to be saved, but because you are saved. In Islam, it's very easy to become a Muslim. All you have to do in Islam is before three witnesses, you say, La ilaha illa Allah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Muslims recite that confession five times a day when they pray. La ilaha illa Allah. There is no God but Allah. Muhammad Rasulullah. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. And so Muslims recite this every time they pray. When someone becomes a Muslim, they make that confession, and that's it. You become a Muslim. That's how easy it is. They pray five times a day facing Mecca. So... That would be east from where we are. Five times a day, they do salat, prayers. In workplaces, they have forced their employers to give them exemptions and accommodation where they can go, walk away from their office chairs, and go to a designated room and do their prayers. This became such a hot topic in Toronto that Muslim students on Fridays, which is their holy day of prayer, were taken from the school during school hours and taken to the local mosque to do their prayers while everyone sat in the classrooms waiting for them to come back. We protested that at the TDSB, Toronto District School Board. And we said that is discrimination against other religions. And they said, oh, no, 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 the Human Rights Code calls for accommodation. Can you accommodate Christians to have devotions during school time? No, we're not allowed to have any religious activities during school time. What about prayers in the mosque? Well, that's accommodation. Just think about that for a minute. During Ramadan, when they're fasting, which is going to begin very soon, you're not supposed to eat in front of your your friends because it it may offend them. Uh, Women, try on the hijab. Let's have hijab day where women can wear the hijab. In other words, this is an attempt to Islamicize Canada. It's happening under your nose. You go to your local grocery store and you have halal sections, halal chicken, halal beef. Why do we need that when there's tons of Muslim stores all over the place? It's called jihad. It's assimilation. It's slowly assimilating the culture under the Islamic banner. Why? Because Islam is a political, religious ideology. They're doing it in France. They're doing it in England. I was told by a confidant, uh, an ex-Muslim, his name's Matt Solomon, he, he had connections with members of the House of Lords in, 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 Oxford, in, um, in London, in, in uh, the Parliament. They were talking to him already about terms of surrender in the future to Islam. That's England. 
England falls, the Commonwealth's going to fall. Third thing, they must fast during the month of Ramadan. So Muslims, during the month of Ramadan, 30 days from sunrise to sunset, they do not eat. Uh, they, some don't even drink water. They do not engage in sexual relations with their spouses. Number four, they give alms. The zakat is the giving of alms. This is done to support jihad around the world. So Muslims support the cause of Allah by funding ISIS and Boko Haram and Al-Shabaaz and all these various Muslim jihad groups. That's what the almsgiving is for, to support the cause of Allah. Number five, all Muslims must perform the Hajj, the pilgrimage, to Mecca, where they go to the holy shrine, the Kaaba, and they run around it seven times, and they kiss the black stone and so forth, and everyone's wondering, what in the world is that? Well, you have to understand that the last four uh, of these pillars are pagan. All the pagans practice these things prior to Islam. Islam is simply paganized monotheism. And yet they tell Christians, you guys are the cross worshipers. Really? Why you guys caress and kiss a black stone on the corner of the Kaaba? A stone that Muhammad said on the day of resurrection will have eyes and mouth and tell Allah, yes, this guy, he smooched me and hugged me. Please have mercy on him. So in my ministry to Muslims, I bring this stuff out. I provoke them to think. And the Lord, by His grace, has brought many Muslims out of Islam. I've baptized a lot of Muslim families who've left Islam. And yet some Christians listen to what I'm just saying and saying, that is very offensive. You're not being very sensitive. You need to be nice. Romans 12, 9 says, hate that which is evil and cling to that which is good. When, when, when Jesus confronted the religious leaders of his day, what did he say? You whitewashed sepulchers filled with rotten bones. You blind guides. You lead the blind and they fall into a ditch. You cross land and sea to make one proselyte and then you make them twice the sons of hell that you are. Depart from me, you cursed ones, into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Where I am coming, you cannot come. You are, like your father, a murderer and a liar from the beginning. Who said that? That was Jesus. Yes, that was Jesus. That is the voice of love in the flesh. Because truth and love are sisters. Ephesians 4.15, speak the truth in love. So what do our churches do? We're going to love bomb people. We're going to tell them how much we love them. Well, what about the truth that they're lost and they're going to hell? Well, we don't want to offend people. And then you have the, 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 the turn or burn preachers. You better turn, you're going to go to hell, brother. Nothing's about, nothing said about God's love. We need to balance those two. We speak the truth in love. Jesus Christ was the most offensive person who ever lived. He offended everybody. He offended the Pharisees. He offended the Sadducees. Remember the Sadducees? What was it that they didn't believe in? They didn't believe in the resurrection, right? That's why they were sad, you see? And then he offended the zealots. He offended his own disciples. He offended his own family. His mother and his brothers came to him because they thought Yeshua was getting a little off kilter. It's time to come home, Yeshua. Who's my mother, my brother, my sister? He points to those who are hearing his word. He says, these are my brothers. These are my sisters. These are my mothers. Those who hear the word of God and do them are my family. What does the Quran say? Some quotes from the Quran. The Quran says, argue not with the people of the scripture. That title, people of the scripture, in Arabic is al Kitab. It means the people of the book. That's the title for Jews and Christians in the Quran. That's the code word for Jews and Christians. Don't argue with the people of the scripture unless it be in a way that is better, advantageous. Save with, with, with such of them as, as do wrong. Don't deal with those who do wrong. And say to them, so this is what the Muslim is supposed to say to us. We believe in that which hath been revealed unto us and revealed unto you. In other words, we believe in your holy scriptures and we believe in our holy scriptures. No, they don't. They tell us our scriptures are corrupted. And I tell them, you are disobeying Allah because Allah tells you to believe in our scriptures and you, better, you know better than your God. That's where they get really defensive. Because now you've got them against the wall. 
Allah says, believe in the scriptures that have been revealed to the Jews and the Christians, and you're supposed to believe in your scriptures as well, but now you're telling the Jews and the Christians, your Bible's corrupted. Well, which one is it? The Quran never says the Bible's corrupted, not once. It says it's the word of God. There's light and guidance in the scriptures. It tells the Christians to judge by the gospel. If you don't judge by the gospel, then you are an unbeliever. I'm doing what the Quran says. I, judge, I read the gospel and I can tell you Muhammad is a false prophet. It's the Islamic dilemma. Either way, Islam is false. But then it says, and say your God and our God is one. And unto him we surrender. We have the same God. No, you don't. Allah doesn't even know what Christians believe. The Quran thinks that the Trinity is God, Mary, and Jesus. Any Christians believe Mary is the second person of the Trinity? No, I didn't think so. Even Roman Catholics who revere Mary wouldn't go that far. Even the Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox, will not go that far. So the Quran is divided into what's called Meccan chapters and Medinan chapters. They're very easy to distinguish. The Meccan chapters, the early chapters, are very fond and amicable, very friendly with the Jews and the Christians. Why? Because Muhammad was in the minority. When you're in the minority, you play nice. And it talks about Christians, you guys are wonderful, and you guys believe in God, and you have nothing to fear. And then when Muhammad went to Medina, the Medinan chapters were revealed, and guess what it says? Jews and Christians are the filthiest of all creatures because they have rejected Allah and his prophet. Fight them, subjugate them, kill them. Kill the Jews who claim to have killed Jesus, even though they didn't, because Jesus in Islam did not die. He wasn't crucified. He was rescued from the cross. You don't have a dying savior in Islam. Jesus is not even a savior in Islam. He's a teacher, he's a prophet. He points the way to Muhammad. He points to Islam. He doesn't say, I'm the way. He points away from himself. They have another Jesus. He's not the biblical Jesus. And so the Quran then says, this is a Meccan surah. You can see it's a Meccan chapter. It's very friendly. But then you get these types of chapters in the Quran. The religion in the sight of Allah is Islam. Chapter 319 of the Quran. What does this mean? The only religion that belongs to Allah is Islam. He doesn't accept any other religion but Islam. You can't stay as a Christian. You must become a Muslim. The Quran goes on to say, if anyone desires a religion other than Islam, never will it be accepted of him, and in the hereafter, he will be the ranks of those who have lost. Allah will not accept any religion but Islam. That's why Muslims are converting people. And you know who they're converting very successfully? People who raised in the church. And you know why they're converting people in the church? Because... Many churches in this country and in North America and in the West don't teach their people how to defend their faith. Praise God that we have these apologetic series here in this church. They're concerned about the defense of the gospel. I get mothers calling me with tears. My, my daughter's left the church. She's marrying a Muslim. Did you ever teach your daughter about the defense of the faith? Did your church ever teach about the defense? No, we never did that. There's a reason. God's going to hold pastors responsible. The shepherds are responsible for their sheep. God's going to hold them responsible. The cults are the unpaid bills of the church. They exist because we're not doing our job. They're doing what we should be doing. When God plants a church, Satan plants his chapel nearby, not too far away. And so... The Quran is very clear. Now you're probably wondering, why are these Muslim, why are these women in North America marrying these Muslims? These, I mean, you see Sinead O'Connor converted to Islam, and, and, and then you hear about these, these women donning the hijab and the veil. And What in the world are they doing? Well, that's because they don't know Islam. Let me tell you what Islam thinks about women. Men are in charge of women. Amen, I don't want to hear any amens as I'm saying this. Men are in charge of women because Allah has made the one of them to excel the other. And because they spend of their property or the support of women, so women are property in Islam, so good women are the obedient, guarding in secret that which Allah hath guarded. But as for those from whom you fear rebellion, admonish them, banish them to beds apart, and scourge them. Then if they obey you, 
Seek not a way against them. Lo, Allah is ever high, exalted, great. So if you suspect infidelity from your wife, even though you have no proof, you can scold her, you can separate, sleep in a different room from her, and you can scourge her. The Arabic word there means to beat, to scourge, to strike, to hit. This is why domestic abuse is a major problem in the Muslim world. I have friends, uh, my future son-in-law, God willing, he's a police officer in Toronto with the 52 Division. He tells me about domestic cases all the time involving Muslims. Well, I'm allowed to hit my wife. It's God's law. It's the Sharia law. It's the Islamic law. Not in Canada it isn't. No, but God's law supersedes the criminal code. What do you do? Are you, are you an Islamophobe, Mr. Police Officer? Are you an Islamophobe? Our Prime Minister doesn't take too kindly to Islamophobes. This is a major problem, folks. So women in the Quran, this is just one passage. There's other passages that say the, the multitude of, 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 of people in hell are women because they were disobedient to their husbands and they're deficient in knowledge and in religion. If a Muslim man is praying, there are three things that annul a prayer, that cancel the prayer. If he's praying and a donkey walks in front of him, cancel, do it all over again. A dog walks by, cancel, do it over again. If a woman walks by, cancel the prayer because a woman is on the same level with a donkey and with a dog. Is that how Jesus treated women? But Muhammad is the role model for all humanity. And notice I'm quoting their text. This isn't me saying it. I'm quoting their texts. What about Jews and Christians being friends with Muslims? Muslims are warned not to become friends with Jews and Christians. All you who believe, refers to Muslims, take not the Jews and the Christians for friends. They are friends one to another. He among you who taketh them for friends is one of them. Lo, Allah guideth not wrongdoing folk. So when I talk to my Muslim friends, I say, are we friends? They go, absolutely, Tony, we're friends. You're disobeying Allah. Well, what are you talking about? We're in the Quran, it says, take not the Jews and the Christians for friends. They get really agitated. Well, what do I do now? So the Quran says, don't take the Jews and Christians for friends. Why? Because they're polytheists. They're not believers. You know, a lot of people talk about, you know, in the Netherlands, um, Mein Kampf. Hitler's book, Mein Kampf, is banned. Does anyone know what the word Mein Kampf means? My struggle in German. You know what the word jihad means in Arabic? Struggle. Striving. So, the new leader of the Netherlands, Gert Wilders, is now is trying to pass legislation to ban the Quran because he says the Quran is far more insidious than Hitler's Mein Kampf and its anti-Semitism. Just think about that for a minute. This whole thing with the, the, the Palestinian war in Israel, pro-Palestinian supporters out there in front of Mount Sinai Hospital. What does a hospital have to do with this conflict? They're protesting outside Mount, Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto, and they're saying, free, free Palestine. Palestine will be free from the sea to the river. Basically, that's the intifada. It's a call to annihilate all the Jews. And so Muslims say to me, Tony, free Palestine. I said, amen, free Palestine from Hamas. Free Palestine from Islam. Bring them to Jesus, and there'll be peace there. The whole thing with the Palestinian-Hamas conflict, and the word Hamas, by the way, is the Arabic word for violence, that whole conflict is based on the Quran because the Quran calls for warfare against the Jews until they're all annihilated. Muhammad said the end will not come until all the Jews are killed, that even a Jew hiding behind a rock, a Jew will say, the rock or the tree that they're hiding behind, the tree will say, O oh, servant of Allah, there's a Jew hiding behind me, come and kill him. You think Mein Kampf is bad? That's pretty bad. Well, we never hear this in the media for some reason. The Hamas Charter says, they quote that passage, by the way, that I just quoted. The Hamas Charter calls for the complete annihilation of the Jews. And what do we do? we got to stop this war in Israel. Would the United States act that way if they had missiles rained upon them day in and day out? Do you think the U.S. would respond by saying, let's just, ah, bygones be bygones? No, they'll go and they'll pulverize the lights out of you as they did in Hiroshima and Nagasaki to bring that war to an end. Today, we have sympathizers with terrorists. 
You know the Palestinian state was created? There's research that's gone into this. The idea that the Jews were never in that land is preposterous. Why? Because they deny that David and Solomon, that Solomon built a temple on the Temple Mount. They're Muslims. Why would they build the temple? This is dangerous. Well, what about Jesus? Because of their saying, the Jews, we slew the Messiah, the Jesus, the Son of Mary, Allah's messenger. They slew him not, nor crucified him, but appeared so to them. And lo, those who disagree concerning it are in doubt thereof. They have no knowledge thereof, save pursuit of a conjecture. They slew him not for certain. This one verse of the Quran, 600 years after Christ, Muslims quote this and say, Jesus of Nazareth was never crucified. He never died. The Quran is very emphatic. They killed him not, they crucified him not. No death of Christ, no resurrection. No resurrection, no gospel. Am I right? If Christ be not risen, you are dead. Your faith is empty. Satan strikes at the very heart of the gospel, the death and resurrection of Christ. Muslims don't believe Jesus died on the cross. They have no savior. Fight against those who believe not in Allah, nor in the last day, nor forbid that which has been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, Muhammad. And those who acknowledge not the religion of truth, that is Islam, among the people of the scripture, Jews and Christians. What are Muslims to do? Fight them. When Muslims become majority, then jihad kicks in. So they start off minority, be nice, play nice, play nice with the host country, say that everything's fine, Islam's about peace. And then when they become 15 to 20 percent of the population, terrorist attacks start. Have we had terrorist attacks in Canada? Yep. Remember the one in Ottawa? Where he went into the parliament building with a gun and he was shot down? Remember that? And he killed a guard at the tomb of the unknown soldier? Justin Trudeau played the whole thing down. To all our Muslim friends, we know that this was an isolated incident. No, it's an incident based on the Quran and the Hadith. Fight against them until they pay the jizya, that is, a poll tax. Under the Islamic State, Jews and Christians pay a special tax called the poll tax, the jizya, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. The Jews say, Ezra is the son of Allah. They never said that. There's no documentation. And the Christians say, the Messiah is the son of Allah, the son of God. This is a saying from their mouths. They imitate the saying of the disbelievers of old, Allah's curse be on them. So the Quran calls Allah to curse every one of you here today because you believe Jesus is the son of God. Is that Christophobia? You bet it is. Will you hear this in the media? Never. They're lying to you. Well, my Muslim friend says Islam's a religion of peace. Your Muslim friend is not an authority in Islam. Their texts are. I'm not an authority. Their texts are. Quote the texts. May Allah's curse be on them. How they are deluded away from the truth. The Quran calls for subjugating Jews and Christians to fight them. The enemies of Allah. Verily, those who disbelieve in the religion of Islam, the Quran, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, from among the people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, and the al mushrikeen referring to the polytheists, they will abide in the fire of hell. There it is. That's your destination. They are the worst of creatures. Isn't that lovely? Jews and Christians, you are the worst of creatures because you don't believe in Muhammad as a prophet. Then it says this. They are the worst of creatures, verily those who believe in the oneness of Allah and in his messenger Muhammad including all obligations ordered by Islam and do righteous good deeds. They are the best of creatures. So if you're the worst of creatures, who's the best of creatures? Muslims. But there's no apartheid in Islam, you see. Um, Israel is an apartheid state. Ever been to Saudi Arabia? No non-Muslims are allowed to set foot in Mecca. It's a holy city. Only Muslims are allowed. And you have signs on the highway saying Muslims only, non-Muslims here. That's not apartheid. We need to wake up. Islam is a Trojan horse. The Trojan horse is already here. And we think that it's a gift from the, from the Muslim world. It's not. It's an invasion. 
And I'm not being mean by saying that because I've had ex-Muslims tell me this, that they were sent here for that purpose of spreading Islam and converting Christians. So all this migration into Europe, able-bodied young men, no women, no children, just men, with cell phones, my parents were immigrants to this country, most of them came with $20 in their pocket. These guys are coming with suitcases, the RCMP are acting as bellhops at, uh, at uh, the, the, the Quebec border there with Vermont. How can we help you, sir? Yeah, so let me carry that for you, right here. You get free checks, you get free welfare, you get free health care, and our veterans are sleeping on the streets. John Calvin said, <clears throat> when God decides to punish a nation and judge a nation, he appoints wicked rulers over them. We have wicked rulers over us. It's a judgment from God. The church has been asleep. She's disobeyed him. She has not shared his light. Because we're too comfortable sitting in our pews with our blessed assurance, I'm going to heaven, I'm saved by grace alone, which we are, but we become lazy Christians. And we think we don't have to do anything to our dying neighbor. Why do you think they work and they kill themselves in jihad? Because that's their one-way ticket to heaven. They have to work for it. But we need to care for our Muslim friends. Muslims make the best Christians, by the way. Every Muslim that I've seen come to Christ makes the best Christian, the most zealous Christians. We owe it to our neighbors to share the gospel with them. Let's take some questions. We have some time for questions. Yes, sister, you had a question. 